Good day, everybody. This is Christopher Bear. This is going to be your immunology lecture for OEM 201. That's uh, Human Pathophysiology, Spring 2017. Uh, this is going to be a video in a series of videos covering immunology and the immune system. And this will be a series of videos designed to fill in for the lecture that I will not be able to do in the face-to-face -face setting on Monday. So let's go ahead and begin. Uh, when we talk about the immune system, the immune system is interesting in many different ways, but one specific way that I find it interesting is that this concept of memory, where you have a memory of an event, and then that memory can be stored for days, weeks, months, years, and even decades, that that kind of uh, process is not something that is very common in the, the human organism, and we only really see that in the, uh, the nervous system. Uh, so that is a very unique component of the immune system, and I thought I would just bring that up as, a, as an interesting aside. Okay, so let's start with a quick review of, of the immune system. So what is the immune system? Well, the immune system is really, really designed, or rather has been evolved, to protect the body from foreign invasion. That's one of the uh, major things that it does. And, and these foreign invaders are what we call pathogens. And, and a pathogen is just something that can cause disease, is a, is a biological agent that, that can um, cause disease. Um, these foreign invaders can, can either be um, uh, prokaryotic cells uh, like bacteria or even eukaryotic cells uh, like a fungi or amoebas, um, or they, they can even be um, subcellular, uh, such as uh, uh, viruses and, and prions, or what are called protein infective particles. So there are a lot of different things that fall under the umbrella of a foreign invader or, or a pathogen. We just need to uh, recognize that lots of different things can potentially be pathogens, and it's, it's absolutely remarkable that we have this system that is able to uh, deal with these this very wide variety of uh, pathogens all right so that's the first thing the second thing is it's been evolved to enhance the repair of uh, injury and illness associated I issues and this is uh, one of the major areas that is primarily involved in this is the inflammatory um, process and inflammation while sometimes can be very problematic, and we'll talk about when inflammation can be problematic, inflammation is very good at flooding a diseased or injured area with nutrients and allowing um, phagocytic cells to enter that area a lot easier, uh, a lot more easily than they normally would, and, and they can begin the process of cleaning that up and um, enhancing the healing process. Um, and then the third major thing that happens with the immune system is that uh, it's, it has been evolved to identify and deal with faulty cells. These are cells within our own body that, uh, for a variety of, of reasons, uh, no longer work as they should or are problematic. Um, the immune system has uh, been evolved to get rid of those cells or to repurpose those cells um, through some really interesting intracellular signaling mechanisms or we call chemotaxis and chemotaxis is kind of an intra intracellular chemical uh, signaling system and the immune system uh, is typically very good at doing this and in fact there are uh, there are there are studies looking at um, the human organism over the lifetime and it's very likely that most of us have actually had or will have cancer at several at several points in our lives, and uh, because our immune system was so capable, it actually was able to mount a, a response and actually kill off those cancerous cells, which are cells of our own body, um, and actually clear a body of that cancer without us really ever knowing. And and only 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 some of us, or ultimately about half of us. Or, over the, over the our, an entire lifetime will actually develop uh, overt manifestations of, of cancer 
of malignancies, et cetera, uh, which is, is actually remarkable when you think that, you know, we may end up getting cancer uh, perhaps a half a dozen or more times in our, our life, but our immune system is able to, to fend that off. So this is a very important part of the, the immune system is, is dealing with um, cells that um, have uh, lost their specialization, um, that are dividing uncontrollably, um, and so on and so forth. Okay, so again, aside from the nervous system, this is one of the few areas where we have this concept of memory occurring. Okay, so now that we know what the immune system does, and hopefully this stuff I've talked about up to this point is not really a surprise to anybody. Okay, so let's talk about some of the specialized uh, tissues, organs, and structures within the immune system. So first of all, um, uh, our most important immune cells are the most noteworthy immune cells that we'll be talking about in these series of lectures. Um, most of them come from the bone marrow, and these are progenitor cells, or sometimes known as stem cells, that uh, differentiate out into the different types of blood cells. So some differentiate out into the red blood cells, some differentiate out into uh, platelets or thrombocytes, which are actually cell particles, and others will differentiate out into the white blood cells. And the white blood cells are the workhorse of the immune system, at least when it comes to within the circulating blood. Okay, so let's talk about some of the major types of white blood cells. So we have five major types and I just remember this saying, never let monkeys eat bananas. And that stands for neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils or eosinophils, and basophils. We can further subdivide these types of white blood cells into what are known as granulocytes or agranulocytes. In granulocytes, when you look at them under the microscope, and um, you can reference pictures within your um, textbook for this, uh, appear to have little granules within their cytoplasm um, and then agranulocytes lack that granular structure and of course the these granules are um, um, enzymes typically that can be released by the granulocytes and uh, can be used to mount um, an attack against uh, foreign invaders or pathogens. Okay so your neutrophils your eosinophils and your basophils are um, granulocytes, whereas your lymphocytes and your monocytes are agranulocytes. Okay, so with that in mind, uh, I'd also want to just briefly talk about what is known, what are known as your lymphatic tissues. So you guys are familiar with the circulatory system, but alongside the circulatory system, you have another type of circulatory system, and this is a system that is of course known as a lymphatic system, but it consists of lymphatic vessels that essentially reabsorb interstitial fluid. So fluid that perhaps leaks out of cells or leaks out of the, the vascular compartment and whatever components are within that fluid, um, that fluid can get reabsorbed in the, the central circulation back through the lymphatic um, vessels. So what you get is you get this fluid gets reabsorbed or gets uh, sucked back in, into a lymphatic vessel, but before it gets dumped back into the central circulation, it will typically go through a lymph node. And a, a node is a, you have several collections of nodes, of lymph nodes. You have uh, large amounts of lymph nodes in your thoracic cavity, um, in your ax axilla, in your neck, in your groin and in other areas throughout your body, you have approximately 600 or so um, lymph nodes. And, and basically what lymph nodes are, the, the, these little, little areas that are very rich in white blood cells. And so as that f before that fluid gets dumped back into the central circulation, back into the, the vena cava near the heart, um, it will go through these lymph nodes and these lymph nodes will, will in, in essence, filter that fluid out um, make sure that there aren't any pathogens um, and then uh, allow that fluid to get repurposed or to get placed back into the, the circulatory system or back into the vascular space. Um, and so there is a term known as lymphadenopathy 
And what lymphadenopathy is, is it is a swelling of a lymph node. And, and the swelling of a lymph node, it can mean a, uh, many different things, but often what it means is that there is some sort of infective or inflammatory process uh, distal to that lymph node. So for example, maybe I have a, a, an infection or cellulitis in my hand, and then the, uh, there, of course there's inflammation and going on, and as that fluid, as that interstitial fluid gets reabsorbed, it will pass through uh, the lymphatic circulation and into lymph nodes within my axilla or with my armpit. And then those lymph nodes, uh, there may be, say, some bacteria in that lymphatic fluid. And so um, the white blood cells in that, those lymph nodes will mount a defense to clean that circulation out. And you will have swelling of the lymph node in response to that distal circulation. Uh, lymphadenopathy can also uh, be indicative of uh, certain types of inflammatory diseases um, and even certain types of cancers, uh, a large group of cancers known as lymphomas um, or cancers of the lymphatic circulation also present with a lymph adenopathy or swollen uh, lymph nodes. Um, your spleen is also a very important lymphatic organ, um, blood cells, um, go into the spleen, uh, particularly red blood cells can be stored in the spleen, will go there, die, and break down. And, and sometimes when you uh, have certain types of infections, such as Epstein-Barr virus or mononucleosis, you can get swelling of the spleen and, and other organs. Okay, and then you also have um, lymphoid tissue. And these are tissues that are are not exactly lymphatic tissues, but they're very similar and they have a very similar f uh, function. And we see these primarily in your gut and in, 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 in within mucosal membranes. So um, mucosal membranes that uh, cover your, of course, your gut and cover your um, airways, your upper and lower airways is where we typically find this mucosal uh, tissue. And this is known as GALT or gut-associated lymphatic tissues and uh, mucosal-associated lymphatic uh, tissue, which are specialized uh, lymphatic uh, structures within uh, specific uh, organs and organ systems. Okay, so some additional terminology that we need to be familiar with. Um, so there is a term known as leukocytosis, and leukocytosis is an elevated white blood count. So um, a white blood count is often done when we are working somebody up and we are suspecting an infection or, or we're suspecting some sort of event that may be involving the immune system. Your normal white blood count is five to 10,000 cells. Um, that tends to be um, your normal, and anything greater than 10 is typically indicative of leukocytosis. Leukopenia is just the opposite. That's a decreased white blood cell, cell count, and anything less than 5 would be considered leukopenia. Now, the white blood count, or what we call the WBC, is a very nonspecific uh, test that's done, and it, it doesn't measure individual white blood cells, but rather it's white blood cells as a whole. And so what we will sometimes do is if the white count is elevated, we will do what's called a manual differential or a differential. And we will look at the individual white blood cells and find out which of the five um, happens to be elevated. And that may give us a clue as to what's going on. And um, you can reference the table in your textbook as to what the normal values are for these five white blood cells. But a specific situation I want to talk about, because it is common, is something known as a left shift, if you ever hear that term, a left shift. And, and what happens is, if you have an elevated white count, and we do a differential, and we see that the neutrophils are um, elevated, what we'll do is we'll look at the neutrophils, and there are actually two different types of neutrophils. You have what are called your banded neutrophils, and these are immature. These are neutrophils that have not fully differentiated yet. And then you have your segmented neutrophils, and these are your mature neutrophils. And so what happens typically in the setting of an acute bacterial infection where um, you have an acute infective process occurring, your body will, will send 
it will create and send larger numbers of these immature cells out to the front line, so to speak. And so what will happen is your banded, your immature neutrophils will increase and um, uh, typically more than about 6% banded neutrophils indicates a left shift or a, a um, increased number of immature cells and that is indicative of, of some sort of acute process, typically an acute bacterial infection occurring. Um, the term left shift is, is more or less historical, and it has to do with how we used to do differentials um, on the manual um, counting. We would manually count the cells, and the, uh, the, the bands would kind of show up on the, the left part of the screen that we'd look at, and, and that's where the term left shift came from. So it's kind of a historical term. Okay. Uh, we already said what a pathogen is. It's potentially disease-causing. And uh, I think um, we'll go ahead and uh, cut it off here. And uh, we will pick it up uh, looking at the immune response big picture in the next video. Okay. Thanks for hanging in there, guys.